right, so last time we started talking about mollusks, okay, and we started talking about the characteristics of spinal molluscus, right? They all have a radula, a mantle, a shell, a foot, and a visceral mass, right? And we went some of the details for all of those different kinds of, or all of those different um, characteristics of the phylum. Uh, and then we started talking about the different classes of mollusks, and um, we started talking about gastropoda, right? Which are snails and uh, snails and limpets and abalone. Okay. Um, and then we started. We also talked about polyplacophora, right? What are what's in polyplacophora? Many plates carrier. Many plates carrier. What kind of animals in there? Um, Good. Titans. Good. Titans are in polyplacophora. So let's move on to bivalvia. Okay, bivalvia are uh, mussels, oysters, clams, yeah. okay. uh, and bivalvia means two doors. So these are the animals that have two shells. Okay, and the characteristics of this box are they have two shells, no gradula, and they have siphons for feet. How does shell imagine? Okay, um, so two shells, no radula, because they don't need a radula because they're filter feeders. Okay, so they just simply have siphons that they stick into the water to pull water into their bodies and over their gills, um, and then they filter out food. So they do not have a mantle, or sorry, a uh, radula. Cephalopoda. So cephalopoda are head footed animals. Okay, um, these are going to be things like the nautilus, the cuttlefish, the squid, the octopus, um, and. <laughs> So cephalopoda, um, characteristics of this class, they have a reduced or absent shell, okay, um, except for the nautilus. The nautilus has a very beautiful shell, actually. Um, and when you did your squid dissection, you took out what the shell is of a, of a squid, right? You pulled out the pen, okay? That's pretty much the shell of the squid. And an octopus, octopus don't have a shell at all. Uh, and cuttlefish do have kind of like an internal shell that's a little bit more well developed than squid. Uh, the characteristics of this class reduce their absent shell. They have arms and tentacles okay, um, that have suckers on them. Okay. If you're a squid, you're going to have eight arms and two tentacles, and also if you're a cuttlefish. Um, but if you're an octopus, you're going to have eight arms. Okay. The nautilus will have 60 to 90 arms. Okay. So they're smaller and they are sticky. They don't really have suckers on them. Cephalopods can change color. So they're actually kind of like really good at this, particularly octopus. Octopus are really, really good at changing color and blending into their environment. Um, and I'll show you the video so that you can actually see how it does that. It's pretty awesome. Their head does sit directly over their foot. You saw that when you did your dissection, right? You, get, you saw the, the eyes and the head and then the tentacles were attached directly to that and the arms, yeah. Okay, so the arms are the foot and then you've got your head directly over that foot. And then feeding, they're all carnivores. Okay, so they're all going to be eating things like shellfish, fish, crabs, lots of other stuff. Okay? So, here are examples of things that you can find in this class. You've got your nautilus. Okay, here's what a cuttlefish looks like. A couple different kinds of squid. Okay, so this is the first picture ever taken of a live giant squid. Um, it's 26 feet long. Yeah, they can get a lot bigger than that. But where, where, where is that? That, I believe, was off the coast of Japan. I believe. Well, it's not like so, fairly recent. Yes, within the past couple of years, we yeah. got the first picture of a live giant squid. Last year, we actually got the first video of a live giant squid. So, um, and then you've got octopus. Okay, blue ring octopus, we'll talk more about those. Um, and then Pacific octopus, and then we actually caught a little bit of octopus like this when we went to the tide pool uh, one time. So maybe we'll catch another one. Okay, so this is not in your notes. This is just briefly for your information. Okay, so cephalopods, they're carnivores. They're going to find their prey with their eyes. They have very well-developed eyes. Um, and then they're going to use their arms or their tentacles, and they're going to reach out and grab their food and pull it up. And in between all of their arms, they have a beak, which you saw when you did your dissection, right? And so they'll use that beak to tear up their prey and then swallow it whole, or swallow the pieces. Okay, um, the diet that they eat will depend on where they live. So they'll eat different things depending on where they live. 
Okay, how do they change color? So, uh, octopus, squid, cuttlefish, okay, they will all change color to communicate with each other. Um, they'll also like move their arms and tentacles and stuff to communicate with each other. But they mostly change color. Uh, and if an octopus is scared, it will actually turn white. So it goes completely white. So it's kind of funny. The way that they actually change color is with these specialized cells called chromatophores. Okay? So they're basically cells that are full of a pigment. Okay? And that might be red, that might be black, that might be brown, that might be yellow, okay? it might be blue, but it's full of pigments. Okay? And then that cell is completely surrounded by muscles. Okay? And when those muscles contract, they shorten and they pull on the cell. What they do is they take that brown little cell and they flatten it out. And that color, that pigment that's in that cell gets displayed on the surface of the squid or octopus. When those muscles relax, it goes back into a circle and that color is not displayed on the surface. So you can see here like this picture. So here, this is your chromatophore full of different colored pigments. Let's say this one's pink. Okay, and so when these muscles contract, shortens, and that um, cell flattens out, and the color gets displayed on the surface of the animal. When they relax, okay, those, that, and that chromatophore kind of folds in on itself, and that pigment is not displayed, and so the squid can change color, which is kind of cool. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's actually watch a short video. <laughs> of this. So, I don't know why it's not sunny, but you can see, can you see the octopus yet? Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> it's scared. It is scared, and it oh. inks, okay, to try and swim away. What is chasing it? A person, and then it decides it can't get away, um, and so it kind of like puffs itself up and displays spots like you don't you don't want to mess with me. I'm super dangerous. So now they're gonna do it in slow motion in reverse, so you can watch it like actually like hide. <laughs> so we go, and it's gone. <laughs> You can't even see it. So it's matching the pattern, color, brightness, and texture of the algae. You can put a see-through one in, or it's like, it's like, it's not, um, um, well, it just depends, yeah, I mean, it just depends on what they're displaying on the surface, which is cool. Um, so, pretty cool, huh? And that's all by using their chromatophores. The way that they actually change the texture of their skin um, is they have little muscles inside of their skin that they can contract or relax to make them like bumpy, like make their skin bumpy and help them to blend in. What's crazy is octopus and cuttlefish and stuff are actually um, colorblind. So they can match the color like precisely, but they're colorblind. Their eyes are colorblind. Um, so we're kind of like, oh, okay, how do they match the color so precisely? Like, how do they do that? What's going on? Well, we actually found that um, in their skin, they have these proteins that are called rhodopsins. Okay? And rhodopsins are a protein that are similar to the protein in the back of your eye that capture sunlight okay? and capture light. So they actually have that in their skin so that they can detect the different wavelengths of light and um, match the color that they're sitting on, which is crazy, huh? They also can, so they can't see color, but they can see polarized light. So, uh, you know, if you ever wear uh, sunglasses that are polarized, yeah, right? So, like yeah, so they can see polarized light. So when you do that, like it cuts down on glare and stuff like that, that's why you want to wear polarized sunglasses. They can actually see all of like the different angles of the light and stuff like that, which they think will help to, um, you know, help them match the color exactly. Cool, huh? Uh -huh. So, you can match color and change color. Um, octopus are much better at this than squid are. Um, squid a lot of times will only really be able to like flash colors like red or, or white, but octopus, like you saw, they can, they can match colors and patterns and textures. Great. Okay. So, uh, form and function in mollusks. So how do they perform the seven essential functions that all animals have to do to stay alive? Uh, 
as we've seen, there's a like, wide variety of animals that you find in phylum mollusca, right? So we're just going to use clams as our representative mollusk, um, and then you guys are doing the clam coloring, right? So you're going to use the clam as a representative mollusk. So the digestive system. Um, in mollusks, they have a complete digestive system, okay? So they have one-way digestive system, mouth to eat it, that is complete, okay? Um, so they have mouth, esophagus, stomach, intestine, and then waste exits out the anus. They do have a radula, okay, in order to either drill through things like clam shells, or they will use um, their radula to scrape algae off of rock, or they'll have a beak, like in cephalopods. We'll have a beak in order to tear pieces off of their food. Bivalves are filter feeders, so they trap food with their gills. So they have a siphon, but they pull water in, and then the water goes over their gills where they get oxygen, but then they also trap food, like phytoplankton and zooplankton and detritus, all of those, that stuff that's in the water. Okay? They filter it out um, and eat it. Their respiratory system, they have gills. Okay? So, if they're aquatic mollusks, the ones that we're interested in, they all have gills in order to survive. Um, terrestrial mollusks, will have their mantle really highly folded. Okay, and then they will rely on that folded mantle in order to do gas exchange. Um, in order to do that, they have to remain moist. They have to re it has to remain kind of wet. Um, and if that also means, though, that if they get too wet, then they can drown, which is one of the reasons why you see, like, snails, when it rains, they all come up onto the pavement, right? Um, they're trying to not drown. So. But they get drowned like not in water? Well, in water. So they come up onto the pavement to try and avoid drowning from all of the water from the rain. Oh, uh, The snails. Oh, okay. Worms do that. Worms do that too, yeah. Because they can drown as well. Because they live in the dirt. Because they live in the dirt. Oh, after it rains, it's worms. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a clam has incurrent and excurrent siphons. Um, or inhalant or exhalant, same thing. So they have two siphons. So water comes in through the inhalant siphon, passes over the gills where it exchange ox exchanges oxygen, picks up carbon dioxide, and then exits out of the exhalant siphon. Um, and then the gills will also filter out the food. Uh, after the food gets filtered out, they have these two things called palps that they will actually take, and those little palps will form the food into a little ball and pass it up to the mouth, which is this right here. Okay, so takes all of those that food and passes it on to the mouth. So that's where gas exchange is going to take place for clams. Okay, they do have an open circulatory system. Um, do you remember annelids? So that meant that their blood was always contained in blood vessels, right? Okay. Well, in an open circulatory system, you still have a heart, and you'll still have some blood vessels, but the blood does not remain in blood vessels the entire time. It will pass through these things that are called sinuses, which are basically cavities that um, the organs are located in. So you have, like, the heart, the heart will pump, and the blood will go through arteries until it gets to one of these sinuses, where it'll leave the artery and kind of bathe the internal organs in blood, okay, and then exchange oxygen, and then enter back into a vessel to go back to the heart. We have okay. sinuses. Huh? We have sinuses. You do have sinuses, yes, yeah, so this is true. Um, kind of. Okay. Um, their excretory system. Oh, sorry. So you can see here's your heart, okay, and then here's the blood vessels pump down to the foot where then it leaves the blood vessels, bathes the muscles of the foot, and then goes back right, in the heart, in the vein. So there are cavities in the body that they will used to bathe their internal organs in blood. Um, the excretory system, they have kidneys, okay, the prettiest, they're like kidneys, and um, that will remove any metabolic waste that they have or that they produce from just everyday metabolic processes. Um, and so the kidneys will dump any excretory waste into the excrement siphon, and then that will be exited out of the body. And digestive waste also goes out the anus, which also gets dumped into the excrement cycle. Okay, so 
food and oxygen come in, any digestive and metabolic waste uh, to go out to excrement. Nervous system. So bivalves have a very reduced nervous system. Um, they don't really have a head. They have a few ganglia, but that's it. So ganglia and nerves, and that's it. Gastropods also have a fairly basic nervous system, but cephalopods have a very well developed nervous system. They've got well developed eyes. Um, they've got status cysts in order to help them balance. They've got chemical receptors, touch receptors, all sorts of different things. And cephalopods have such a well developed nervous system that they can actually learn and remember things. So, like an octopus, if you give an octopus like a jar, like a screw top jar, um, and like put their food in there and then give it to them, they can figure out how to unscrew that jar and then get in and get their food. And then they'll remember how to do it. So it's cool. They, um, they can learn, which is awesome. Okay. The musculoskeletal system. So the mollusks will use, move using their foot. Okay, um, bivalves, they have two shells and then one foot, and then they can use that foot in order to dig into the sand um, and to anchor themselves in the sand. Bivalves also, though, can retract that foot inside of their shells and then close their two shells nice and tight to try and protect themselves. So they can pull that foot back in. Gastropods have stomach foot and they just kind of slide along on that ventral foot. How many of you have seen, like, um, a snail as it goes across the, the concrete? And you've seen like the trail behind it? Okay. Yeah, it's flat. So they basically secrete mucus and then pull themselves along like this little mucus trail with their foot. So it's like uh, help them slide? Yeah, so it's help them slide. Why do they have these like spaces in between snail trails sometimes? Like, there's nothing. Yeah, well, they could have stopped here for a little while. It's like two little steps. I don't think it's like a little step, but yeah. Oh, we have one place. So Alright, cephalopods have a head foot region. Okay, the head and the foot combined together. They move with jet propulsion and then their, their foot is their tentacles and arms that they'll use for feeding. So uh, they move with jet propulsion. So, Their reproductive system, they have separate sexes. So you have boy snails and girl snails. Boy snails and girl snails. Um, and depending on the type of mollusk, they, they will either do um, internal fertilization or external fertilization. Um, external fertilization will be done by like bivalves and gastropods. Okay? Um, and so the males are going to release the sperm into the water, and then the female will trap the sperm and fertilize the eggs. Um, internal fertilization will be done by cephalopods so, um, and some of the terrestrial gastropods. So now to populate, the male will pass the sperm to the female and she will take that sperm and fertilize the eggs with it. Alright, so just depends on the kind of mouth. So the ecology of mollusks. Why are they important in the ocean food chains? Um, we actually use bivalves to check pollution levels. So uh, bivalves are filter feeders, right? Clams and barnacles, or not barnacles, maybe uh, scallops, stuff like that, are filter feeders. So they're filtering the water. So they get they encounter toxins first. Okay. So they um, are going to be good indicators for the pollution level um, in the water because they're going to encounter it first and filter it out. Uh, they also fall in all sorts of different like levels of the food chain depending on what they're going to eat. They're, like limpets and gastropods are going to be primary uh, consumers because right? so they're going to be eating algae. Um, and then they can be scavengers, filter feeders, carnivores, everything. It can cause damage to ships and piers. How many of you have heard of uh, shipworm? No? Okay, shipworm is actually like a bivalve. 
um, that has like two shells that it uses to burrow through wood. It can actually burrow through wood and causes all sorts of damage to like wooden piers and wooden ships and stuff like that. So it, it costs a lot of money to replace what they damage every year. And then also they're a food source, right? Because they're delicious. So yeah.